Welcome to episode 10 of Opolis Public Radio. I'm John Power, founder and steward of Opolis, and I'm joined today with by Eric Arsenault. Eric's been working in the Dow space since early 2019, and he currently works with Dow Stack, a governance protocol for blockchain projects, and spends most of his time designing governance and incentive structures for early stage projects and getting involved with community growth efforts. In his spare time, he likes uh, messing around with NFTs and uh, scouting for investment opportunities as part of the Metacartel Ventures effort. So welcome, Eric. Good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you, John. Long time no talk, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> so the inside joke there for everybody is Eric and I have actually been doing quite a bit of discussion around um, the Opolis Rewards Program, which we're going to do quite a bit of teasing on. But before we do, um, you know, Eric, let's talk a little bit about Dow Stack and your work there. What is, um, what do you tell everybody about Dow Stack, what it is? I mean, a lot of people from the crypto space sort of know about it from the early days of it, but like there's been quite a bit of evolution and other things that have gone on. So why don't you kind of get us up to speed? Yeah, so um, Dow Stack emerged from the whole ICO boom in, in 2018. Um, I, got the, I still have the card that I got from like, East Denver 2018. I don't even have that. So there you go. <laughs> You're, old school. Yeah, yeah. Old school right there. Um, so yeah, it, it sort of emerged from, from that whole 2018 boom um, focused on uh, building a protocol for decentralized governance. Now, you know, I don't know how familiar your audience is with, with what decentralized governance is or why it's important. Um, but you know, like, high level um, in the traditional world you have companies and you have CEOs and, and corporate members making making decisions for for these organizations. centralized power structures yeah yeah these these hierarchies we're, we're kind of used to um, and in these decentralized networks um, you don't really have this power structure you just have token holders and and stakeholders and so the question is how, how do you govern a network of uh, token holders. Um, and so, you know, generally you have these, these protocols that are governance protocols like DAOSAC that allow token holders to make decisions together as a collective uh, network um, through voting and other mechanisms. Um, so that's what DAOSAC is. Um, and we've been doing that since 2018, um, really focused on um, the problems associated with with governance at scale so when, once you have uh, large groups of individuals trying to make uh, decisions together um and yeah so you know right now we work with various projects trying to uh, design uh, their governance and working with projects that that you know want want to decentralize um and need the the, the tech to do that so how did you get interested in this i mean this is not obviously water cooler discussions usually at like your regular nine to five job or something like we should talk about decentralizing hierarchical power structures and creating new systems of governance to help yeah that's just not what people are typically talking about so tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested yeah so you know i i, I got interested in the whole crypto space um in a similar way to a lot of people um I think it was um, a colleague of mine had mentioned blockchain in, in 2017 and I s slowly started researching, got interested, curious. And, you know, before I knew it, I, I felt like I had seen the future, right? Like, you know, you, you kind of fall into it and you're like, what is this? Like, this is definitely a red pill. Yeah, it's exactly. You had, your, you had your Neo moment. I had the Neo moment, uh, like many of us have. Um, and, you know, at that point, I, I decided that I, I wanted to be in the space. I wanted to work in the space, live in the space. Um, and, you know, so I, I left my job um, and I started applying to companies and, and trying to see how I, I, I can start making a living in the space. Um, and probably around six months after I started applying for jobs, I discovered this thing called DAOs, um, which was new to me at the time in, in 2019. And, and 
I realized that you can start working in these decentralized networks and getting paid for it and be part of these communities with, without any, you know, centralized power saying, oh, you're hired or fired or, you know, it's, it's just open doors. It's just a community of people working. Much more um, fluid. Yeah. So I just started participating really at a grassroots level in some DAO communities, specifically with Genesis DAO, which was a DAO stack DAO that they had launched. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another and, uh, you know, six months, eight months later, <clears throat> I was participating in various communities, uh, full time, just getting paid, uh, from various DAOs, um, getting grants here and there. And, um, that's, that's how I started essentially in, in the decentralized governance space. It's just really from a grassroots level. So then you and I met really more like directly earlier this year at ETH number 2020. Yeah. We did a lot of uh, sort of governance experiments and things with the, well, the Buffa DAO at the time. Yeah, that was fun. Um, V2 of that's going to be really interesting. Maybe we should tease that too. <laughs> um, maybe. We'll see how much time we have. Um, but then we, we uh, so Opolis is sort of a unique animal. Um, what what I really liked about our initial engagement with this is like you seem to get it right like the idea of building this this ecosystem for employment that really bridges the two worlds right the this sort of old world and the new world I think once you kind of get it and sometimes people it takes them a long time to get it like some people still haven't gotten it you know that I've introduced the concept to but you seem to get it really quickly what what is it about Opolis that you think stands out to you is is you know worthy of sort of your time and investment? Um, that's a good question. So at, at DaoStack, I, I spent a lot of time mapping out the DAO la landscape and trying to understand what the the different archetypes are and the different use cases are. Um, and Opolis, I would say, falls in this category of of DAOs that are um, you know, uh, collective buying power DAOs, where you have you have a group of people using uh, buying some good or buying some service, and what happens is if you have many of those people, kind of what happens in in like Groupon, for example, once you have many of those people buying a good or service, you get economies of scale and you get um, you know benefits for for doing that because you have collective purchasing power. Um, so Opolis to me was was probably the first use case for this this DAO um, archetype, um, and the the first use case that I came across that was actually you know close to fruition to to actually doing something. You know, it was all theoretical Be, until being I being real. To you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I spoke to you, I got excited because I it, it was a use case that I had been thinking about, but you know there was no no leads or no partners at that point that I was working with um, that that would make it happen. So when we spoke, you know it was very clear that like that that was the use case. But on top of that, it was a use case that had a lot of potential because you're talking about payroll services. And you know, as we know, it's it's a really massive. The industry. U.S. The, the U.S. payroll is thirteen trillion dollars. <laughs> yeah, how's yeah, that exactly. for a, a market size opportunity? That's just the U.S., right? Like, I mean, it's something like seventy-five trillion globally, or something like that. I don't remember the. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter, even. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. so big. Like you, you couldn't. I mean, if you did, if you did actually build a global public utility infrastructure for employment and sort of fluid work opportunities as, as a base layer of a person's commercial experience, you know, that commercial protocol of experience for the individual, I mean, that'd be insane. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, that's why I got interested. And that's why, you know, obviously you, your enthusiasm helps because, you know, like <laughs> if you're some... You know, I don't know. If I, I know some. You can some, replace the word enthusiasm <laughs> with insanity, but okay, yeah, I'll take yeah. it. So your, your insanity helps a lot because you know <laughs> you, you need someone driving that, and and um, it's contagious. And you know, I I got excited about it, and you know, still am. I think it's it's a really great use case for 
applying these principles of decentralized network and empowering people. Um, and in this case, you're empower, empowering, you know, a whole network of freelancers and employed, uh, self-employed individuals, which is, you know, that's amazing. Yeah, it's the, it's the sort of migration back to solopreneurism. I think it's, I think it's a fascinating socioeconomic, you know, case study to watch, but I mean, it's a lot of fun to work on it. So let's give everybody a little backdrop on this. So we started, what was it, really right after ETH Denver, maybe early March, like, you know, early COVID style, like. Start yeah, right uh, afterwards. <laughs> right our, after, really architecting what we didn't really at the time, it seemed like, uh, even have a, a full direction on, you know, how to go about building the, this, you know, the tokenization of the commons, you know, like we didn't really have a good, you know, and I do want to get, get into some of the kind of learnings that we went through and sort of like the regulatory things that we've explored and, you know, just, it was kind of an interesting academic exercise too. I mean, it was like yeah. a real, real life research project. I mean, like we'd already done a bunch, but then getting into the actual economics of this and, and like putting pen to paper, so to speak, was a For very sure. different thing. Yeah. We, I mean, we iterated probably <laughs> three times on, on three totally different models. Right. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of uh, learning and in, in, at, at the surface level, you think about one and then, and then you get, deeper and then you realize oh this really doesn't make sense or you know you got it you got it yeah we had a, a big learning that way i think with the the original idea was to use a bonding curve yeah. one of one of the original ideas was to yeah. use a bonding curve to kind of uh, create the continuous funding sort of mechanism to the commons but we actually got away from that yeah. And after like a long time, like what, a month and a half, two months of working on that? Yeah. 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 It was, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I don't know. I, I think we, we kind of, I don't know what, what originally made us go down that path, but I think both of us thought it was a good path. <laughs> well, I think, I think we looked at, I think Nexus Mutual is one, you yeah. know, it was sort of like a, a case study of, of, of somebody, a group that had used a bonding curve. But then we, as we were really looking at the details of that, I think we sort of started seeing some of the, sort of the cracks in the armor mm -hmm. of the reasons why perhaps it might not be a good idea. Um, both regulatory concerns, secondary market concerns, gaming concerns, you know, or just yeah. maybe just, just the, the overall flaws of the model, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, I learned a lot more about bonding curves than I knew <laughs> before. I thought I knew about them, but I actually didn't in the end really know as much as I thought that I did. That yeah. Was, that was interesting, but I, I think we both did. Yeah. All right. So, um, high level, how would you, okay. So before we get into that, yeah. so just to tease this with everybody, we're going to be launching our token paper, and uh, for for widespread distribution early next week, right? Okay. So yeah. this is, uh, so just to give everybody the cadence of this, we're launching the paper now and the program, there are some technological requirements for the program that we have to complete. And it's estimated that, you know, we probably sometime in early 2021, um, we'll actually be ready to launch the, the formal uh, rewards program. So now that I've sort of cast out the net, be prepared to find all of you all listening, uh, the token paper distributed through all of our typical channels. You know, it'll be on Medium, it'll be on our website, it'll be in, through Twitter. Uh, I'm sure you'll see it through a lot of our partners. We'll be, you know, retweeting and sharing. Um, I'm sure you'll do, be doing the same, Eric, right? Yeah, for sure. So let, let's talk about the, the mean potatoes of it then. How would you describe the overall, you know, uh, goals of the program and, and, and the tokenization of everything as it relates to Opolis, of course, but how would you describe that in sort of a couple sentences for everybody? Cool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, so I think, or, or feel free to give us more than that then yeah. Just ex explain in one ex sentence <laughs> in three words, explain, yeah. <laughs> uh, stakeholdership capitalism. <laughs> Go for um, it. Yeah, I think I think 
you know what I was thinking about this earlier because I I had a feeling you'd ask to to kind of break it down. Um, the the best explanation I I could think of is like almost thinking about it backwards of like okay what's the end state we want to we want to reach, and the end state in my mind is um, a bunch of freelancers paying for uh, employment services, but instead of paying some you know centralized entity. In, in like they do in the typical world what they do is they they funnel their funds to a collectively owned organization a, a, a DAO um, and then and then that DAO can can um, find uh, service providers for the employees um, and so it, it it pools together all that purchasing power and it allows everybody to to uh, get services as a collective the the governance of the 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 DAO or this this pool of funds that that everybody uses um, is collectively owned by the members so the the people paying into that service through through a token so everybody shares ownership over this has governance over this and can choose where where those services are uh, provided um, and other people as well can own this token if they want uh, and get some benefits. Uh, but that's the basic premise where you have a, a group of employees so owning this collective. Really? Yeah. Uh, but now the interesting thing is we're also using a legal framework of a uh, Colorado limited, uh, like a cooperative, right? A limited cooperative association is the official name. And we're sort of pairing that with this sort of DAO framework. So there's legal standing for this cooperative, but it's also sort of operating like a DAO, right? Yeah. So it's like a digital co-op, I guess. A digital know. cooperative, yeah. yeah. Digital employment cooperative. There's the three word sentence. It's a digital employment cooperative. <laughs> there so, <you> go. <laughs> I fixed it for you. There you go. Thanks. Now it's, it's, it's been uh, really interesting to sort of watch this unfold. So why don't we run through the, incentives then and like who can participate the stakeholders right so sure. i'll just list them off so we have uh the 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 most incentive that you're going to have in this program is to be what we refer to as an employee member right so employee members are the people consuming the payroll and employment services right so i'll have my employment through the employment commons i will be having my paycheck coming to me on some periodic basis right so for that consumption I'm being rewarded with this token. And by the way, I'll mention this, that like we're not selling this token to anyone actually. It's, it doesn't have a, a price or any value as we launch this. Yeah. Whether or not it does will be a, 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 an act of markets, not anything that we do if anything happens, right? Like the goal would be to scale and grow this as a community such that perhaps there would be intrinsic value but right out the gate, we're not doing any of that, right? Like this is, this is purely an, an, an experiment in, in sort of digital rewards, right? So I'm gonna get rewards for my consumption of services, right? Yeah. So let, let's just abstract an example. So I got $100,000 in salary or whatever that I'm gonna put through as a software developer and I'm getting paid every other week and the aggregate for a year is 100K and i got my health insurance and everything through the through the stack and commons is providing all these different compliance services for me um i'm basically going to get rewarded based on that consumption yeah we call this uh at least the term we use in the papers uh, payroll mining yes. so you're, you're you're mining tokens um and getting rewarded with tokens uh for for using the for my consumption yeah. right okay so then that's that's group one right so Group two is uh, referrals, right? So we're, what we're trying to do here is activate the network effect by incentivizing people to give referrals to the commons and increase that total payroll volume. Now we should probably explain how the, the payroll mining works, right? So each, block that gets mined is based on some uh, total payroll volume. We call that the commons um, payroll volume, the CPV, 
right? The period, and it's periodic in this case, right? So there's this periodic payroll mining number or pay, the, the total payroll volume that then translates to once we hit certain growth thresholds, um, a, a block is mined, yeah. right? So these so, tokens are minted. Yeah, no, another way to, to think about that. Um, so you have different groups of, of stakeholders that, that get rewarded with tokens. Um, and every block, let's say, there's a certain amount of tokens that get released to those groups of people. And it gets harder and harder to, to mine those blocks over. So the first first block, um, you know, it's 100,000 tokens uh, to those those four groups. Um, and only once you hit a certain payroll threshold, the next block can be mined. Um, right. And those those payroll thresholds get bigger and bigger as the the, the, the block mining difficulty gets harder because that growth requirement gets bigger each time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? Yeah, so essentially from an game design incentives, what we're doing here is we're aligning everybody, individuals and the, co the whole co-op to want really the same thing, which is more payroll volume, right? So if I'm interested in this, the first thing that I would do is be like, well, I got to move my payroll over there so I can get the, the rewards for my own consumption. And then that's going to, you know, my individual contribution is going to ultimately help that block be released, right? And then the earlier that I get in, because the blocks are the same size, right? So the actual rewards are the same size per block, it's best to get in early, right? So it creates that sort of, you know, FOMO network effect potentially. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. But the, but the idea is to reward early adopters, right? To say like, look, you got in early, you're going to get a lot more rewards tokens. I mean, they're not worth anything right now. You can just stack them in your wallet, but like, you know, see what happens. I mean, of course, I think we've designed this thinking that, you know, if, if, if we really build the, the commercial value of the network that intrinsically there would be some value down the road, but for now, we're not doing any of that, right? We're not selling it to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Okay, so we've got one for consumption, and it's all about based on this this joint payroll block, which is the CPV number. So, like the the commons payroll volume has to go up, 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 and the number that we've set that at right now is what ten percent. So ten percent growth per block. Yeah. So every every time we increase uh, payroll volume by ten percent, a new new block, new reward issuance is 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 right. And then obviously at the lower numbers of members in payroll volume, it's a lot easier to see that go up because on a, um, a payroll cycle basis, you know, it doesn't take that many people to get ten percent when you're at you know low no lower fifty numbers. members. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But when you're at you know fifteen thousand members, it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, exactly. Okay, um, so that's consumption and referrals. Now, savings. Yes, yes, and we also, uh, it's like a savings, so we can move to savings. So uh, the common word that we use in the DAO world is staking, but we've sort of decided to say um, savings because we want it to be more accessible for average people. Right, so they can sort of correlate it to some activity that they know, right? Savings account being a good idea. So why don't you explain staking and, and you know, AKA savings for us? Yeah, so, so if you have tokens, if you're a token holder, if you've earned tokens by, by using the employment commons or you purchase them on the secondary market, if there is one, um, you can use those tokens and, and lock them up um, in a contract and um it, it'll drip you rewards um so you know in a similar way to the other two um reward mechanisms those rewards would uh be issued based on the payroll volume mil milestones um so in the beginning it'll be you know you'll get more rewards since um the growth of the um we'll be hitting those payroll volume milestones more frequently but um you know, throughout the life of the, the, the employment comments, it, it'll be issuing uh, rewards for stakers. Yeah, and what I think is really interesting about staking from from an economic sort of 
you know, just theory perspective, it, it, it really is a, a market signal for faith in a project, right? Like I'm literally willing to hold these tokens and I'm, I'm going to stake them in this project and I'm going to like, I'm going to earn my, you know, returns, my, my returns on returns. I'm going to get my staking reward, but like, I really believe in this project, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. seems to be the main signal that comes out of that is really, is, is that it's really that belief factor. I think secondarily, you know, if there were ever to be sort of secondary market demand for these, you know, staking them locks all this up. Right. So like as a, as an employee member, I would imagine that, you know, if I had any idea that this could actually be worth anything in the future, I might like really just try to hoard everything I could get and just stake them, yeah. right? Hoard and stake, consume, hoard and stake. I mean, really? I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, it seems yeah. like that would, that would be the sort of rational path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I'll be doing, I guess. <laughs> if I could, well, I don't know. I'm Canadian, so I don't know if I'll be able to use. Well, coming to Canada soon, don't worry. There you go. Uh, well, plus you'll have, uh, you know, of course, uh, let's talk about the other sort of there's contributors, right? So there's technology contributors and other things for the trustee. Right. Um, so the trustee Opolis Inc, which is the official trustee to the employment commons um, provides the technology and services stack for consumption, right? So as you mentioned earlier, uh, the commons has gone out and, and procured this service. Now, of course there's a handful of us sort of doing this right now, but we've procured this service and for really the initial investment in the commons and standing it up, the trustee also will have the ability to issue um, the rewards to technology contributors and other marketplace contributors that are actually adding value to the commons, right? Yeah. So there will be other mechanisms and other means of earning tokens like you're doing, like you've contributed in the form of helping me write the, the paper and, and build the model. Like, so there's, very fluid ways to kind of be involved, right? And I, I see that accelerating in the future, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think I think that's a key part of the whole equation is making sure that, you know, th there are tokens available for, you know, technology contributors, for, you know, partners, um, things like that. After all, um, you know, the employment commons is, you know, a, a business, it's a digital cooperative. Um, and so having having tokens to to perform those activities is going to be important. Um, there's also the 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 a pool of tokens that are going to be reserved for the commons themselves. So you know the right. all the members will have a pool of tokens that they can use, you know, to pay for things that they think are important, marketing or you know, whatever else, whatever. But, yeah. I mean, ac acquisitions of technology, it could be, um, other service providers, new features. I mean, whatever, right. Yeah. I mean, it could yeah. be pretty much whatever it wants to be. Yeah. So let's talk about, there's two things that we, we really stress a lot as we talk about things. It's the sustainability and then the benevolence. Okay. So there's two things I want to kind of unpack here. Uh, the first thing is the community fee for sustainability and why that exists. So um, we have a 1% community fee that of course, for the first 12 months, you don't pay as, as a member. So like everybody gets 12 months free. And then after that, it's 1% of your payroll volume, right? Whatever that is. So on the hundred thousand dollar example, it'd be like a thousand dollars a year that I'd be paying. Um, tell me why that's important in the model for sustainability. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that just to pay for the service providers at the end of the day? I mean, without that fee, then there's no well, way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so really paying for the operations and services that actually exist yeah. in the stack. Now, theoretically, we've talked about the idea where the commons at some point is going to be really governed by the members. They yeah. could shut off the fee. Why would it be important not to do that in a crypto economics well, type of way? I mean, at the end of the day, all the members have a common interest of, of 
obtaining services because they're, you know, they need the services as members. Um, so by shutting off the fee, they, they would essentially remove their ability to pay for the services that they require. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would expect, you know, if I look into the, my, my crystal ball, I would expect members decrease the fee at some point, you know, and, and maybe negotiate with service providers and, you know, do things like that uh, to, to get their collective benefits. After all, I mean, that, I think that's one of the core value propositions of, of the commons is that you, you have collective purchasing power and you're able to leverage that. So I, I would expect the fee to decrease, but I mean, obviously it can't go to zero because you're just... Then, then well, I mean, if we did go out and get $13 trillion under management, you know, on a global scale even, like you could charge probably a lot less than 1% yeah, and be just exactly. fine. So I guess yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the, just so everybody knows, this is like one of those sort of attack vector things that we had talked about with respect to membership and, you know, where's the incentive not to just turn it to zero and, you know, we had to kind of build in some mechanisms to protect this sort of what we call the sustainability of the ecosystem. There's a lot of crypto projects that don't have sort of a, an economic engine. And then the ones that they do have become highly centralized and extraction based, right? So like it, it, it sort of misaligns. So this was our effort at aligning sustainability with the, with the members of the commons, right? So and the 1% number, we just in research and talking with our membership seemed like a pretty nominal number. Most people could raise their consulting rates or whatever they're doing 1% and their customers wouldn't even notice. Right. Right. All right. So the benevolence component to this, let's talk about the governance structure and kind of how we're thinking about this. So initially we have this thing called the stewardship board. Do you want to explain that? Yeah. So, um, I guess th this whole project, um, you know, it's, it's rather complex in nature. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's, it's pretty ambitious. The, the aim is to decentralize, um, but there's no way we can go from day one and just be completely de decentralized. There's too many risks. You know, if you have 30 members and they own this massive pool of tokens in their treasury or, you know, th there's a lot of issues related to decentralization uh, from day one. So, I think with with this project, one of the the core assumptions is is that we're going to be progressively decentralizing um, and making decisions that that move us closer and closer to decentralization over time as we feel comfortable. And so um, the the stewardship board was was implemented to kind of just allow uh, us to to govern um, the the networks and the key decisions of the network. Um, in a semi-centralized way uh, to begin with. So um, there's going to be a group of us um, that uh, control a multi-sig with, with the funds and um, decisions are going to be made from there and voted on. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know, John, what, what, what sort of decisions do you imagine you're probably more familiar with the guts, but like what, what, yeah, what I mean, sort just, of you know, is? like, I mean, it could be what, what features and products are offered. It could be like, you know, um, changes to even fee structures initially until mm -hmm. we get to a certain membership. Right. So I think right now we have it at a thousand members where it'll start shifting back to the community. Cause I think that's a big enough size of, of, you know, uh, membership. So you're not yeah. going to have sort of weird, sort of controlling governance problems with like early adopters just sort of hijacking everything. Um, so just so everybody knows, the, the initial stewardship board is, is, is set at five, but it's gonna grow to nine. And then any, anything that's gonna be deemed sort of a major change to the protocol requires a, a super majority of six right. um, to, to actually implement a change. And then even as the membership takes the reins of decision making, they'll still have to be ratified with the stewardship board. And then you also wouldn't be able to, like for me as an example, like if I'm on the stewardship board, which I am, I won't be able to vote my personal uh, tokens or you know, as governance or my personal membership as an employee, I won't be able to vote that. I will only be on the stewardship board. So like you, you can't sit in both pools. So like we're really trying to protect the, the benevolence of the structure. So individuals yeah. that are on the board aren't what you would see on a typical board of directors. It's 
not investor types. It's not just the capital, right? It's, and in fact, the employment commons isn't invested in by anything. It's really just a membership. Uh, it's a digital co-op. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the investment is really into the trustee, which is really arm's length relationship from, um, from the commons, but th there we've carefully organized this such that the individuals on the stewardship board are employee members of the commons and they have unique um, skill set and ability to contribute to protecting the benevolence of the commons. Yeah. Right. And we, we haven't gone into this too much in our conversations, John, but um, you know, we could also implement some sort of really informal uh, governance for, for members themselves that has no effect on the protocol, but at least allows members to voice their opinions and vote on things. Um, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's part of the, the district's conversation, the guilds, remember? So we're, mm -hmm. there's going to be this meta governance that exists underneath the actual protocol where people will be able to organize into their own little groups and have their own little sort of voting blocks and decide things that are sort of important to them socially, politically, whatever yeah. they want. Um, as it relates to their paychecks and their money. I mean, one example I've used a lot is what if a bunch of people got together and created a, um, a pool for UBI for themselves, for their group, right? They could do that inside their little guild in the commons, but it wouldn't be something that the commons would mass would implement, you know, to everybody. Right. It wouldn't be forced on anyone. And then a membership in any of these guilds would be completely opt in, opt in, opt out, right? So like no one's being forced to do anything that they don't yeah. want to. And then I could imagine thousands of flavors of this popping up, whether it's geocentric guilds, skill set guilds, social political right. guilds, that kind of stuff that would kind of pop up inside the commons. Yeah. So that's, that's phase two. We, we got to get enough people <laughs> in, in the commons itself for that to, to be, um, I think, probably, well, phase two. You'd be yeah. the, next, the next thing. All right, so um, I'm just going to remind the audience here, if you have any questions, feel free to pop into the Q&A and put it there. If um, We're going to wrap up here in just a few minutes, um, and we're going to wrap up uh, officially. We're going to end the podcast at quarter two, so just everybody knows that, um, uh, that that's going to happen. So we'll, we'll go ahead and finish a couple of topics here, Eric, and we'll see if anybody jumps yeah. in with a question or two. Um, Let's see governance structure we've talked about that we've talked about launching so we're gonna we're looking at what early q1 next year sometime probably is most realistic it may be ambitious for the technological <laughs> requirements but i guess we'll find out yeah i think we're we're gonna find out uh, soon what what needs to be built for an mvp there Yep, very cool. So yeah, that is, so everybody knows um, our next stage for this is we are in into the technological requirements building stage. So <coughs> we have, <coughs> excuse me. Oh boy. He's alive. My, my enthusiasm, <laughs> just I, I, I choked on my own enthusiasm. <laughs> so we are going to be moving into um, the actual building of the of the protocol or the, the 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 governance layer of this right and all of the distribution mechanisms technologically so that's going to take us a few months to do and that's going to be in parallel with a capital raise that opolis inc is doing so um opolis inc will actually be doing a traditional series a and um the investors of opolis inc um will be eligible for uh, a reward for that contribution because Opolis as the trustee is actually being granted a certain amount of uh, tokens for rewards that we're not selling any tokens. So there's, you know, don't think that you're buying a token, you're actually buying equity. And then we're just sort of throwing this in as a reward as one of the activities that's seen as valuable to the commons, right? So that investment, even though secondhand to the commons is something that the commons is blessing and saying, yes, we, we, we do think that this is valuable because ultimately the trustee is really what helps stand all this up in, to begin with. So what, uh, what's your final thoughts on this? I mean, if, you know, if you were to think about like, what's the most important thing somebody could, could know about this outside of what we've covered? Is there anything that we've missed? Um, 
I don't know. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to validate this model because I think it really opens up tons of opportunities just in terms of, you know, very similar models of consumption-based models that can be used in all, all sorts of aspects of our lives. So, you know, I think, I think that to me, I'm really excited to see where this goes, uh, what the, what, what sort of governance we come up with and what sort of community we come up with. Um, and, um, in terms of what we missed, I, I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot more details coming out in the paper. I mean, this we're really glancing at a high level and, you know, it might be hard for some people to follow, but, um, you know, next week we're going to have a lot more information. Um, yeah, to me, I think it's, it's, it's really exciting because we're finally after, after some months of, uh, you know, brainstorming and, uh, banging battle, ahead against battle testing, like a whole bunch yeah. of interesting things, but, to find out aren't so practical and feasible things like <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting to see how well in some ways it's actually pretty simple and straightforward in other ways it's a fairly complex orchestration of stakeholders right so because there are if you weren't doing this there's some pretty distinct fractured interests right if you mm -hmm. didn't have these alignment mechanisms yeah yeah definitely i think you know i mean you've mentioned to me um for a long time like that the, the the necessity of having benevolence, uh, you know, and and I think that that's like super important to you, but also, I mean, I, I think it's a really great cause because I mean, you know, you've you've seen firsthand the issues associated with that. Um, well, especially and, with employment, employment's the most yeah. like, outside of your family. It's like intimate, man. It's like it's it's like your your life, you know. It's what in it's the engine of what makes everything else go and the the hierarchical and paternalistic methods is just you know it just seems mm -hmm. really interesting to me like how you can be so exploitive of people in in the game of sort of necessary evils of employment right and compliance and taxes and paying taxes and all of that it just seems like we should have a much more benevolent sustainably benevolent yeah. structure and and set of technologies and whatever we want to call it, you know, protocols to, to help people have that sort of egalitarian baseline of their commercial life, right? Like where it's, we're sort of getting out of, we're, we're sort of raising the bar of sort of call it the equality game of giving people equal opportunity, you know, making it more fluid for people to exist commercially. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think if, if we achieve the vision of, of, doing that and you know i think with the incentives that we have um we're, we're pretty close of you know finding the right incentives to get people excited i mean i, I to me it, it's going to be really exciting to see this materialize and see okay you know did are the incentives the right incentives and and then learning as we go um and you know tweaking and building a community i think it's gonna be really exciting yeah, and I think your point earlier, um, I just want to sort of dovetail on this. I think payroll as a use case is is an obvious one once you actually get to know like how it works and, and mm -hmm. everything. But I agree with you equally that taking the template that we build here and applying it to virtually every consumption-based business you could think of, you know, the, the consistent consumption, right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. payroll is very very frequent in our world it's bi-monthly right so it, or um semi-monthly but like anything that involves like subscriptions <laughs> toilet paper i don't know whatever you want I mean, I mean whatever whatever you want it to be i mean it could be you know you think about like you know the uh, subscription services that they have on, on amazon prime you know you think about like my cable subscription you know like if i was actually getting paid in tokens that might have some value to them in some sort of network effect gained, you know, that I was playing, I might actually have stuck around with like, I wouldn't have cut the cord, you know, because like, I just feel like they're making me pay for all these channels I don't want. And I have no incentive to care, aside from just what, what my monthly budget expense is, right. But if there was yeah. actually a way to kind of create this new dimension of stakeholder capitalism and all of these sort of consumerism type activities, I might play them different. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it also doesn't help if there's you know, it's Joe Schmo getting paid twenty million a year. You know, 
you, come on. I mean, right. I, the, the alternative here is, is very compelling. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be really exciting to see this play out. Yeah, very much. Well, it doesn't look like we had any questions come in. So um, I guess we're going to just uh, go ahead and sign off. So I am going to thank you, Eric, in front of everyone, first and foremost, because I'm just going to give everybody a little transparency here. Eric is not getting paid right now to do this. Okay. And the amount of times, the amount of time and the amount of, you know, proddings that he's taken from me has been more than worth anything I could possibly have paid him. And your contribution is incredibly invaluable to this. Your, your just thoughtfulness and your insights and your, you know, your, your enthusiasm, but in a very measured way, like I'm very random enthusiasm. You're much more measured and much more like disciplined than I am when it comes to, to enthusiasm. So I appreciate that. And I look forward to building this with you because it's, it's, um, it's been a ton of fun so far, but like, it's just the beginning. So thank you for, yeah. thank you, John. Everything. You're welcome. Yeah. So everyone else, thank you for joining this episode of Opolis Public Radio. Uh, remember to subscribe to Opolis' YouTube channel for more videos just like this and anywhere that you listen to your audio versions of podcasts, if you prefer that version. Remember, if you're a freelancer, a gig worker, solopreneur, independent contractor, looking for an employment solution, we're in quarter four as of tomorrow. If you're looking for health insurance or you're a U.S. qualified worker, Check out the employment commons. Come visit us at opolis.co. That's O P O L I S dot C O. And we'll see you there. Thanks, everybody. We're out.